peptic ulcers are focal defect in the gastric or duodenal mucosa which is caused by an imbalance between mucosal defense and attacking force that is acid peptic injury so ulcers are the focal defect in the mucosa that's the first thing and usually ulcer means the focal defect is already cross the muscularis mucosa layer okay muscularis mucosa is a part of the mucous membrane or mucosa i should say mucosa has got three parts one is mucous membrane another is called lamina propria and third is called muscularis mucosa so when it crosses muscularis mucosa layer we call it ulcer before that we call it erosion so ulcer and erosion have a slight difference there both may appear a bit similar ulcer is of course bigger than uh, erosion you know but the depth also matters and the cause of that peptic ulcer is imbalance between the defensive force and the attacking force we'll talk about that in pathophysiology they may be acute or chronic but usually peptic ulcer means they are the chronic type of ulcer okay chronic and microbiological sampling of the upper gi tract often reveals the presence of helicobacter pylori in a case of peptic ulcer disease means h pylori is one of the very common cause of peptic ulcer disease these days and if i want to give some data to you 100% of the duodenal ulcer cases are associated with helicobacter pylori 100% and regarding the gastric ulcer about 70 to 80% of the gastric ulcer cases are associated with h pylori infection so that shows you the importance of that bacteria now what are the sites of peptic ulcer the common sites are regarding the duodenum or duodenal ulcer it is the first part of the duodenum and regarding the gastric ulcer it is towards the lesser curvature of the stomach now see here this is the schematic diagram uh, here is a gastric ulcer okay though in this picture it is shown uh, right in the middle or uh, slightly towards the greater curvature but actually in uh, you know the patient uh, the ulcer may be formed somewhere here okay somewhere here or in this side and there is a reason why the ulcer usually forms towards the great uh, lesser curvature side anybody know what is the reason yes anybody what is the reason why gastric ulcer usually forms towards the lesser curvature side yes i'm talking about the peptic ulcer or gastric ulcer benign ulcer the reason is quite simple when we swallow the food okay the food usually flow in this area okay it flows from this side and distally and it is collected after it it flows here you know it slowly collects from here and is going up and up so this area comes in contact with you know irritant type of food drinks whatever we are eating all the time so there is a higher chance of ulcer formation in this area okay this is the reason uh, sir yes yes uh, mm, sir it can all uh, sir it can also be sir because the uh, um, like said the lesser curvature sir it is at a higher chance of like sir the aspiration of the duodenal contents are mainly yeah yeah that is another reason that is a you know not the usual causes of peptic ulcer but because of some complication for example if pyloric sphincter is not working properly or if there is a bit of pressure development in the site or yes, some sometimes when we when we do the reconstructive surgery remember the remaining part of the stomach is directly connected with the duodenum things like that then there may be a chance of reflux you are right and during that time also there is more uh, you know chance of contact of lesser curvature and the pyloric area than the greater curvature now thank you sir the less common site for the ulcer formations are uh, given there and they are the lower end of the esophagus gastroenterostomy stoma when you anastomose remaining part of the stomach with intestine this is known as gastroenterostomy stoma 
Mikkel's diverticulum, every student know that already, because Mikkel's diverticulum contains ectopic gastric mucosa, which may produce acid. And even the other parts of the stomach, like greater curvature, even the, you know, uh, towards the fundic part, towards the pyloric part, other parts of the duodenum, like second part, third part, or fourth part, or even the jejunum in case of Jolinger Ellison syndrome, because there is a high amount of gastric acid present in that condition. And this is because of gastrinoma, a type of tumor which is seen in pancreas. So these are some other less common sites. Let's move on. Now, let's move further. What are the etiology? Let's talk about it. In both types of peptic ulceration, gastric or duodenal, there is an imbalance between the aggressive and defensive force. In duodenal ulcer, there is an over secretion of acid, whilst in gastric ulcer, there is an impairment of mucosal protection. This is absolutely important concept you should have right now. So see there, in duodenal ulcer, there is an over secretion of hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Whilst in gastric ulcer, there is an impairment of the mucosal protection. Probably there is increased prostaglandin, you know, uh, a concentration or level. There is decreased amount of mucus production or secretion. Okay, those all are considered the defensive forces there. So rather than increased attacking force, there is problem in defensive force for gastric ulcer, whereas in duodenal ulcer, definitely there is a more, you know, a point on attacking force. Now, uh, all of you please focus on this picture. This is very easy one to understand. These are the normal because the aggressive forces and the defensive forces are in balance. Okay, they are in balance. That's why there is no, you know, ulcer formation. And aggressive forces are gastric acidity and peptic activity. And these are the defensive forces. See there. Surface mucus secretion is one of the very, very important defensive force. Bicarbonate secretion into the mucus. Bicarbonate can neutralize the acid. Mucosal blood flow. So any, any type of ischemia can you know, decrease this defensive force, like shock. Apical surface membrane transport. Apical surface membrane transport means you know, this is important for the you know, general health of the epithelium. Epithelial regenerative capacity and elaboration of prostaglandin. Everything is well known here. This prostaglandin has a very important role to play. That's why if we inhibit the production of prostaglandin there, it has high chance of ulcer formation. Okay, like use of NSAID type of drug. They cause ulceration by this mechanism. Okay, so these are the defensive forces. Now see this, when the aggressive, uh, you know, aggressive forces are more, okay, than the defensive force, there is high chance of, uh, you know, ulcer formation. And that ulcer is mainly duodenal ulcer, like helicobacter pylori infection, use of the NSAID, okay, uh, cigarette smoking, alcohol consumption, and even Zollinger Ellison syndrome, okay? And some of them are either decreasing the defensive force also, not all of them will increase the attacking force. Some of them are also uh, causing the, you know, uh, decrease in defensive forces. The perfect example I want to give here is NSAID, NSAID, okay? It is decreasing the secretion of prostaglandin there, prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are mainly defensive type of force. So you can clearly write it in the other side also. Now, impaired defense, ischemia or shock, delayed gastric emptying. So there is a prolonged contact time between the food and the mucosa and duodenal gastric reflux. So the bile is refluxing back or that acidic sign is refluxing back towards the stomach again. And some other are NSAID and helicobacter pylori. These are the impaired defense. So what is the bottom line or you know, take home messages here, there should be clear cut imbalance between the attacking force or aggressive force and the defensive force. 
Okay, sometimes both things are occurring together. Even in gastric ulcer, it is not purely the defensive forces. Please remember that. If there is no acid, there is there is no ulcer formation. So acid content should be there. Okay, but which is more common than the other? This matters here. So in duodenal ulcer, the attacking force is more powerful than the defensive one, whereas in gastric ulcer. the attacking force is there but it is less important than weakening of the defensive force now that is the pathophysiology of uh, ulceration now let's talk about some of the etiology or uh, let's list some of the etiology here okay see this helicobacter pylori is one of the most important cause it predisposes to both type of ulceration duodenal as well as gastric okay and it can lead to ulceration by both mechanism that is by acid hypersecretion and by compromise of mucosal defense non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs <clears throat> all those example every student know okay uh, right from the aspirin diclofenac ibuprofen enomethacin okay naproxen celindac and all those the use is thought to lead okay peptic ulcer disease predominantly by compromise of the mucosal defense that is they inhibit the prostaglandin secretion what about paracetamol what about paracetamol does it cause peptic ulceration or not it doesn't okay paracetamol is considered a safer one that's why uh you know uh, we we often prescribe paracetamol for the control of fever smoking increase acid secretion and duodeno gastric reflux so the incidence of peptic ulcer disease is twice in smoker than in the general population so smoking itself can lead to peptic ulceration stress ulcers okay for example curling ulcer now curling ulcer is the term we use in case of burns if peptic ulcer develops or gastric erosion or gastric ulceration develops in burns we call that curling ulcer and they are associated with decrease in blood flow there okay some other types of stress ulcer are called cushing ulcer now can you tell me what is cushing ulcer Uh, if there is any injury in the brain and increase the intracranial pressure and uh, intracranial hemorrhage lead to the uh, Cushing ulcer. Sir. Exactly. There is also called the von Rokitansky Cushing syndrome, sir. Okay. okay. Now this Cushing ulcer, okay, is associated with increase intracranial pressure because of any intracranial infection or intracranial lesion. So this is a very common term or general term, you know. remember the term cushing ulcer comes from the cushing stride cushing stride there and cushing stride is the combination of three things one bradycardia another is hypertension and third is irregular breathing this is also seen in raise icp so this cushing ulcer is seen in increase icp so these are two important terms which may be asked to you in different exam that's why i have highlighted here once again another is jollinger ellison syndrome okay everybody know that now this helicobacter pylori is a bacteria okay uh, which accounts for 100% of the duodenal ulceration but that alone may not be responsible there may be some other causes as well okay but it is associated with 100% of the cases so when i start treatment of duodenal ulceration i should always uh, involve the regime which treats or kills uh, helicobacter pylori as well if i do not include that you know my treatment would be incomplete and the patient will again come back after few month with similar type of features now let's talk about the pathology of a benign peptic ulcer so how it looks see there the edge of the ulcer is punched out okay punched out means very regular you know uh, a type of margins or edge like this 
the margin of the ulcer are not hip top as often seen in malignant ulcer hip top means they are raised from the surface okay because there is a rapid growth in case of malignancy and that type of rapid growth is not present here in case of benign ulcer this is also known as benign ulcer and ulcer which occurs in carcinoma of the stomach is called malignant ulcer so the margins of the malignant ulcer are hip top means they are raised from the surface whereas in benign ulcer it is not like that the floor of ulcer usually contains a white slough this slough is a necrotic tissue there okay this one this is also important feature there we can clearly see it with the help of endoscope or gastroscope the mucosa surrounding an ulcer is relatively normal there are radiating folds which may be present due to fibrotic contracture see this this is a chronic type of inflammation which is going on there is a ulceration developed so there may be a radiating fold which may be present because of the fibrotic contracture okay see some of the folds may be a bit of fibrotic here otherwise they may be normal rugosities or rugae as well so these are some of the important features now why we should remember this remember uh, if uh, if the surgeon is doing upper gi endoscopy or if the doctor is doing upper gi endoscopy there they can identify the ulcer because of this important point and if any doubt exist they can take a biopsy from the age of the ulcer biopsy is always taken from the age it is not taken from the base of the ulcer remember that base only have necrotic tissue from the age of the ulcer the biopsy should be taken to rule out malignancy only in case of gastric ulcer in case of duodenal ulcer it never turns into malignancy so there is no point taking the biopsy now after knowing this thing let's talk about the clinical features of peptic ulcer how the patient present what are the clinical manifestation The number one is pain. Peptic ulcer leads to pain in the epigastric area. See this, and this pain, okay, can come in any part of the day or night. But the nocturnal pain is a feature of duodenal ulceration. Nocturnal pain, usually in the early morning, and we also call it hunger pain. Hunger pain, okay. If the uh, you know stomach is empty. like after few hours of eating for example in the early morning isn't it if if we have eaten um, way before we go to the bed time uh, probably uh, you know few hours later there's no pain but towards early morning the patient feels a bit hungry the stomach is empty so there is the nocturnal pain development in case of duodenal ulceration quite typical feature it may radiates to the back the pain may radiates to the back because of involvement of the ulcer there because ulcer is going deeper and deeper it is going towards the back area or back side so it may also radiate to the back regarding the aggravative factors or aggravative you know precipitating features eating in gastric ulcer and missing meal and a lot of stress in duodenal ulcer are the aggravative factor now let me clarify this a bit more eating or eating food you know causes pain in case of gastric ulcer so because of this patient is afraid to eat patient doesn't like to eat because they are afraid to have more pain because of the effect of the food so they avoid eating and over a period of time they lose weight so gastric ulcer patient may look lean and thin okay another reason also i can give here some of the gastric ulcer cases Okay, may complicate into carcinoma of the esophagus, stomach. Sorry, carcinoma of the stomach. So, carcinoma of the stomach will definitely leads to you know loss of weight, loss of appetite, and all those things again. So, the overall uh, loss of weight occurs in gastric ulcer. Whereas in duodenal ulcer, missing the meal, okay, when the when the patient is hungry. and taking stress will lead to duodenal ulcer or leads to pain in duodenal ulcer rather i can i have to say so patient frequently is eating 
just to relieve the pain. So because of this type of habit, they gain weight. They are overweight or relatively obese type of people. Now, what are the relieving factors? Vomiting in gastric ulcer, whereas eating and drinking into the duodenal ulcer are the relieving factors. Regarding the periodicity of the pain, this is a very classical features of untreated peptic ulcer disease. The symptom lasts for one to two weeks and reappear again in one to two months. So this is periodicity. Probably patient is taking some of the medicine here, you know, <clears throat> to, to relieve the pain, but the treatment is never proper. They, they never take the you know, proper dose or proper length of the treatment. So again, the, the pain will come back. This is the mechanism. So second type of clinical feature is alteration of weight, which we have already talked about. Weight loss is common in gastric ulcer because patient is afraid to eat and patient may gain the weight in duodenal ulcer. Never forget this. It may not be universally truth. Okay? Some of the very lean and thin patient may develop duodenal ulcer if they are having a lot of stress in their life. Okay, Stress is an important cause there. Okay, so nothing is, uh, you know, 100%, uh, you know, in medicine. Remember that, okay? We always talk about whatever is more common. Acid brass, water brass, and heartburn are symptoms common to both types of ulceration, and these are associated with gastroesophageal reflux disease. If there is excessive acid production, that acid may reflux up towards the esophagus and it may result in this type of clinical features. So along with a GRD, who knows, they are also having ulceration in the duodenum or the stomach. So good type of investigation has to be done. Now, there are features of complications as well. If this is a you know, long standing ulcer and if the treatment was not done in time or the proper treatment was not done, then complication may develop like bleeding that ulcer can bleed and those bleeding can be of two types acute bleeding and the chronic bleeding now acute bleed may present as hematomesis or melina quite easy to understand hematomesis is a vomiting of blood and melina is a pass of a passage of dark you know a sticky type of stool okay black colored stool that is melina. And these are features of upper GI hemorrhage. What is the hallmark of this hematomesis? Yes. What type of uh, blood comes out in hematomesis in this case? Anyone? Coffee colored. Fresh, fresh coffee colored or can be fresh also. Both answers are correct, but you need to give explanation here. If the bleeding is not that massive one, okay, means it has time to stay inside the stomach. So acid hematin will be formed and that is coffee colored blood. But if it is a massive ongoing, very brisk type of bleeding, you know, patient may immediately vomit it out and that blood can be fresh red. So see there, both answers are nice, correct. But the explanation is a bit different. Chronic bleeding may present as iron deficiency anemia. So iron deficiency anemia in case of adult uh, is caused by peptic ulcer disease. But this should be chronic ongoing bleeding, not a massive type of bleeding, you know, uh, that, that can only lead to iron deficiency anemia. Another one is a feature of perforation or gastric outlet obstruction. So all of these are important topic on, on itself. The perforated peptic ulcer is a very, very important complication of peptic ulcer, especially duodenal ulcer. And it results in peritonitis. In the beginning, it is a chemical type of peritonitis. But later on, you know, it is complicated by bacterial peritonitis. And then patient may look very sick. Patient may develop septicemia and septic shock. And patient may die if treatment is not provided in time. So perforated peptic ulcer is always considered surgical emergency.
gastric outlet obstruction is also caused by peptic ulcer again more commonly it is caused by duodenal ulcer which is present in the first part of the duodenum or very rarely it is also caused by ulcer of the stomach which is present in the pyloric region or pylorus now there are different causes of uh, you know uh, gastric outlet obstruction here one is because of edema if that area is having ulcer there is swelling edema going on and that edema may block the passage okay second in case of chronic type of ulceration the healing is going on side by side there may be extensive fibrosis in the nearby area or at the ulcerated area and that can result in obstruction so these are uh, different mechanism there now see here uh, in one table it is nicely written here the main clinical features of peptic ulcer and what are the main differences so let's go through that regarding the site of a peptic ulceration gastric ulcer occurs generally in the middle two thirds of the lesser curvature or you can simply say towards the lesser curvature whereas duodenal ulcer is developed in the duodenal bulb duodenal bulb duodenal bulb means first part of the duodenum okay first part of the duodenum now see here regarding the pain okay, regarding the pain what is the main differences 15 to 30 minutes after meal and relieved by vomiting these are the features of gastric ulcer and duodenal ulcer the pain is relieved by meals rather hunger and stress will increases the pain there vomiting is quite common in gastric ulcer and it is not that common in duodenal ulcer and regarding the pathology a uh, gastric ulcer may be benign or it may convert into malignancy whereas duodenal ulcer is never malignant never so these are uh, some of the points and rest of the thing you can always add here i want to add one more association of helicobacter pylori 100% present in duodenal ulcer around 70 to 80% of the time in gastric ulcer regarding the pathophysiology the attacking forces are more important in the causation of duodenal ulcer and the defensive forces are weaker more rather than attacking forces in gastric ulcer okay this is another a uh, differences and regarding the treatment okay regarding the treatment both medical and surgical treatments can be used in both condition but in duodenal ulcer vagotomy is very commonly done vagotomy we will talk about that during the management part vagotomy and gastric ulcer is mainly treated by gastrectomy that is partial gastrectomy never the total one partial gastrectomy so see that so we can add like that if the question comes in our exam so what the student should do you know uh, they should you know consult some other books maybe some other literature and if some more you know features you can add here they should make a note of that you know and if they uh, tell many different distinguishing feature teacher will be quite impressed let's move on now how we confirm the diagnosis of peptic ulcer disease so diagnosis always include history taking physical examination and investigation please make that uh, concept in your mind the student will jump and say investigation when we ask the diagnosis that is uh, a bit of you know some of the examiner are quite particular they will not give you good marks if you answer like that though your answer is not completely wrong you know but the approach is not there so always try to answer like that so what investigation we we order upper gi endoscopy barium meal x ray test for helicobacter pylori and if you suspect zollinger ellison syndrome then measure the gastrin levels so these are some of the important type of investigation now what is the role of upper gi endoscopy 
for the diagnosis of peptic ulcer disease. See here. It is the gold standard investigation for peptic ulcer, means the most important investigation in that regard. That's why it is written as gold standard. So, what are the important points regarding upper GI endoscopy, also known as gastroscopy? It enables direct visualization of the ulcer. And this is the very, very important point. The doctor can directly see how the ulcer look like. Does it look like benign ulcer or malignant ulcer? Where is the exact site? The doctor can see that also. Biopsies can be taken to exclude malignancy in case of gastric ulcer. Only in case of suspicious area, you know, they do that. And to do a rapid urease test or histological examination for the confirmation of helicobacter pylori, this is known as sampling of helicobacter pylori. We can take a sample from that area and do the test. And we can diagnose whether helicobacter pylori is associated with the ulceration or not. These are some of the advantages. A suspected gastric ulcer may be a malignancy and should always be biopsied. Okay. And what are the suspicious point? One is the size, bigger one. Second, hip top margin elevated margin from the surface, okay? Third, okay? Third is irregular type of age, but irregular age. I know there is a punched out age, you know, the benign type of ulcer and malignant ulcer is quite irregular and large amount of radiating folds are there. So this is the hallmark of malignant type of ulcer and it should always be biopsied if you suspect. Now, sometimes upper GI endoscopy can be therapeutic as well. These are the diagnostic purpose. Sometimes they are therapeutic. For example, if uh, the peptic ulcer is bleeding, we can do something with the help of upper GI endoscope to stop that bleeding as well. So this is the therapeutic one. Now, let's move further. Peptic ulcers are benign ulcer which shows the following features. This is such an important question from the surgical point of view. Okay, so it is. it has been repeated more than one time here. They have got a regular outline, which is, you know, uh, quite smooth looking ulcer. The edge is punched out, punched out. It is not irregular at all. The margins of the ulcer are not hip top, as is often seen in malignant type of ulcer, and the floor of the ulcer usually contains a white slough. Slough means necrotic material there, necrotic tissue. So these are the features of benign ulcer. And malignant ulcer are, do not look like that. Okay, they are irregular, the margins are hip top, okay, and size is big. The mucosa, which is surrounding an ulcer, is relatively normal. And sometimes, the radiating folds may be present due to a fibrotic contracture. Uh, uh, as we know, these peptic ulcers are chronic type of ulcer, so fibrotic contractures may be seen. Now, look at here. This is the upper GI endoscopic view of the peptic ulcer. See this, this is a schematic diagram, okay, very nicely shown here. This is a uh, endoscope inside the stomach. And these are the gastric ulcers, which are present in pyloric antrum in this case. Now, it looks like this uh, uh, from the endoscopic view. There's white slough at the base of the ulcer. It is not hip top, okay, or not elevated from the surface. So typical one. The, this is also another ulcer here. Now, in this case, the ulcer is bleeding, okay? The ulcer is bleeding. Now, what is the cause of bleeding in case of peptic ulcer? Sometimes what happens, this ulcer goes very deep, okay? Goes quite deep and it may erode the blood vessel there. Erosion, okay, of this blood vessel will lead to bleeding. And sometimes this bleeding is very severe one. Uh, we have to control it immediately. Otherwise, patient may quickly develop hypovolemia. So 
uh, bleeding from the peptic ulcer is also uh, you know considered seriously and in fact it is the most common complication of peptic ulcer disease that is bleeding now what about barium meal what what type of you know observation we do in a barium meal x ray see there a barium meal is rarely used as a primary means of diagnosis but is useful in patient with the morbid fear of endoscopy now morbid fear of endoscopy means some people they do not give consent for the endoscopic exam now remember endoscopy means they should be given some medicine you know so they they remain a bit drowsy and then a big pipe or tube is put into the oral cavity and then through the esophagus that tube is reaching the stomach and the first part of the duodenum now many people don't like to do that they are quite afraid to do that so during that time we need to do certain other investigation isn't it so this is one of the option now in case of gastric ulcer what is the finding a benign ulcer okay uh, in profile protrudes outside the expected line of the stomach wall exactly like this see there okay like this and like this so it is protruding outside here these are benign ulcer and this b is a malignant ulcer it looks like this so benign ulcer may show radiating mucosal fold from the ulcer okay now another uh, you know picture of the barium barium meal barium meal showing okay see this there is a ulcer here this is a sli slightly going outside and filling with the barium so this is towards the lesser curvature here is the greater curvature isn't it here is the you know first part of the duodenum this one and this is the pyloric sphincter so very nicely seen so it is projecting from the wall of the stomach which is clearly seen here now what about the duodenal ulcer how duodenal ulcer looks like in barium meal as in the stomach you see this as in the stomach an ulcer on the dependent wall of the duodenum fills with barium and shows the radiating folds an ulcer on the non dependent wall is etched by barium and appears as a ring because barium doesn't fill there you know it just you know uh, is collect at the uh, margin so it appears as a ring here now see this see this case this is the eroded area see this okay this patient is in prone position patient is in prone position now you all know what is supine and prone position so in prone position uh, it is shown that the ulcer is filled with barium okay at the first part of the duodenum so the teacher may ask you a question in which wall of the duodenum is having ulcer and patient is in prone position remember so uh, the ulcer is present at the anterior wall because in prone position the ulcer is filled with the barium whereas in supine position just the margin of the ulcer is shown by the barium so it is not in the dependent area isn't it when we supine the posterior surface will be the dependent area so uh, the rim is present here so the ulcer is again present on the anterior wall now after that the third important group of test are test for helicobacter pylori because it is one of the commonest cause of peptic ulcer disease and one of the important test we do is rapid urease test okay rapid urease test now urease is the enzyme which is released by helicobacter pylori so we detect that enzyme that is the meaning it's a very simple type of endoscopic test another is a histological examination of biopsy material and this biopsy material is also taken by endoscope and urea breath test is the third one 
to confirm the cure of helicobacter pylori infection after completion of antimicrobial therapy, we can go for urea breath test. And urea breath test is positive in case of helicobacter pylori presence. If they are completely killed, urea breath test will be negative. Some other type of tests are also there. Okay, so let me write that for you. But in detail, you will study this in internal medicine side. Okay, and those are stool antigen test. This stool antigen test is very popular these days for the detection of Helicobacter pylori. Stool antigen test. Don't forget about it. So. These are the different way. Now, let's talk about some of the complications of peptic ulcer. Okay, in detail, uh, these complications will be dealt in some other topic, but we just mentioned them here. The main complications of uh, peptic ulceration are gastrointestinal bleeding. Now, it occurs in 25 to 33% of the cases, and it accounts for 25% of the ulcer death as well. Now, what is the cause of death in case of bleeding from this ulcer? Why the person die? Yes, what is the cause of death? Anyone? So due to perforation and lead to peritonitis. Okay. Now, see this. This is, uh, this is a case of uh, bleeding only we are talking about, okay? Perforation is talked separately. Now, if they ask you a question, you can, you can definitely, you know, say that because we cannot deny because usually these ulcers, uh, once they start to bleed, they can also perforate. That is altogether a different thing. But wh why we ask this question is hypovolemic shock can develop because of this bleeding from the ulcer. Sometimes especially in case of duodenal ulcer, the gastroduodenal artery can be eroded by the ulcer and that can uh, bleed rapidly or massively, okay? So the uh, answer is again, hypovolemic shock or hemorrhagic shock. Upper gastrointestinal bleeding can be manifested as hematemesis and melina. You already know that. Now, other complications of peptic ulcers are perforation and penetration into the adjacent structure. Perforation and penetration into the adjacent structures. The perforation is very important complication here because it can clearly lead to peritonitis. And if it is penetrated into the adjacent structure, it may damage pancreas, liver, or even retroperitoneal areas. Third one is a gastric outflow obstruction, also known as pyloric stenosis. Now, it may be reversible in the acute condition or it may be irreversible in the chronic condition. Now, what is the mechanism? In the acute condition, there is edema going on, okay? Because of the active inflammation, there may be spasm of the pyloric sphincter muscle that can result in gastric outlet obstruction or gastric outflow obstruction, GOO as the short form. Whereas in chronic type of ulceration, there is fibrosis going on and fibrosis can lead to narrowing of that area. We use the term cicatricial stenosis. Cicatricial means fibrosing reaction. And this is irreversible. So surgery is necessary to reverse this. This is this, these three are the important topics which I will deal with after I complete the management part of peptic ulcer disease. Okay, all of these are important topics in themselves. And the, another type of complication is a malignant transformation. Some of the gastric ulcer cases may convert into malignancy, but duodenal ulcer cases, there, there is no report okay, of conversion into malignancy. Now, the final part of the discussion of peptic ulcer disease is the management. Very, very important part, you know, of this topic. You need to understand this very well. See here. So we have divided this management to different headings. First is the general management. 
then medical management then surgical management so general management would be we advise the patient to do these things like stop smoking if the patient is a heavy smoker or even you know a uh, light type of smoker uh, the smoking is never beneficial uh, to our body even for the gi tract you know it can uh, produce a lot of problem avoid taking up nsaid group of drugs now nsaid clearly lead to erosion and ulcer formation one or two doses may not be that damaging for a chronic intake of your nsaid you know is definite cause of a peptic ulcer disease reduce stress where possible now what is the mechanism why stress leads to ulceration yes why Sir, stress increases the stimulation of the uh, hydrochloric acid. Yes, sir, increase the secretion. Excellent, very good. That is the there connection. Is, mm, yeah, yeah, sure. Mm. Also, sir, mm, sir, it was the same, sir. Please continue. Yes, 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 sure, sure. So, if if it is same, you know, you you can say, yeah, the answer is that only. So. whenever the person is having a stressful condition or situation yeah. there is increased secretion of hydrochloric acid and that is mediated by corticosteroid okay or cortisol that is one of the important mechanism there cortisol will increase the production of hydrochloric acid remember that so stressful conditions are strongly associated with ulcer formation so we have to tell our patient to decrease the stress if possible complete uh, you know decrease of stress may not be possible you know because uh, we develop stress for so many different physiological conditions as well now other are medical and surgical management now what are the medical management of peptic ulcer disease the aim of the treatment from the medical management side is to relieve the symptoms of peptic ulcer disease mainly the pain to heal the ulcer as quickly as possible definitely to prevent the recurrence of peptic ulcer formation and to prevent the complication these are the aim of the treatment and we have got some wonderful drug to do that okay and these are the following group of drugs one our first group are called antacid these antacids are gastric acid neutralizing drug second the drugs which reduce the gastric acid secretion itself and we have got two wonderful you know drugs for this regard one is s2 receptor blocker and another are proton pump inhibitor ppi another group of drugs are mucosal protective drugs now can you name some of the drugs here which are these mucosal Shuk protective sir my sucralfate basement compound and prostaglandin analogs excellent i already told this very good i already got those three important drugs name there very nice okay one is misoprostol this is prostaglandin analog misoprostol second sucralfate and third is bismuth compound absolutely correct so these are all of them are mucosal protective drug and then we have anti helicobacter pylori drugs now we are going to talk about that you know this is a combination of the antibiotics with some ppi drugs again these are triple therapy and quadruple therapy accordingly some of the you know names of the drug would, would change there now this is a important part of the management and many doctors are forgetting that let me talk a bit of practical issue here many of them they simply give only ppi or s2 receptor blocker uh, and completely forget about helicobacter pylori treatment and this is not going to treat the patient well because after you stop taking those other medicine then there will be recurrence or relapse of the ulceration because you have not you know uh, killed those helicobacter pylori there now antacids neutralize the gastric acid and provides prompt relief of pain so whenever we have uh, you know a pain or acute type of pain from peptic ulcer or gastritis antacids are the drug that relieve you know 
that uh, quickly relieve the pain. So they are fast in acting. There are two types of antacid we have, alkaline salt, which neutralize the gastric acid and foaming antacid, which may coat the stomach. So it may act a little bit longer. So there are different types of aluminum salt, magnesium salt and sodium bicarb as well. But these are not very popular, you know, because they are quick in acting and they do not decrease the production of acid. So uh, popular drugs are H2 receptor blocker and PPI. Now drugs which reduce the gastric acid secretion, okay, they are H2 antagonists and PPI, like ranitidine, famotidine, roxatidine, nizatidine, these are the different examples. And proton pump inhibitors are omeprazole, pantoprazole, lansoprazole, rabiprazole, isn't it? All those drugs are there. Longer acting than H2 inhibitor, and these proton pump inhibitors are the most effective drugs in healing benign peptic ulcer because they are prolonged in action, okay? And they can reduce uh, the uh, production of hydrochloric acid substantially. So they are very powerful drug and very good drug in the treatment of peptic ulcer disease. Now, the third group of drugs we have are mucosal uh, protective drug, okay? Mucosal protective drug uh, like sucralfate, misoprostol, and even bismuth can be included in the list. These are the drugs which are designed to improve mucosal resistance of the acid means they protect the mucosa from the acid damage. Sucralfate is a mixture of aluminum hydroxide and sulfated sucrose, uh, which protect the ulcer from acid pepsin attack. So it will coat the base of the ulcer, okay? It will coat the base of the ulcer and it will not allow the further damage by that hydrochloric acid and pepsin so that ulcer will heal slowly over a period of time. This is done by sucralfate. Misoprostol is a prostaglandin analog. It inhibits the acid secretion. At the same time, it is protecting okay, that ulcer. Uh, uh, it is protecting the ulcer because it is also inducing the production of mucus there. Okay, mucus there. And it is used to prevent gastric ulceration in patient who are taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug because this NSAID decreases the production of prostaglandin. And if you provide misoprostol from outside, they may balance each other. So the side effect of this drug would be less in case of stomach. But rather than this, you know, another uh, point I like to highlight here, if possible, you stop these medicines like NSAID if, if, they, if it is not necessary for the patient, then why you continue to give these medicine, isn't it? You go for some other better options than them. That would be advisable rather than using misoprostol and NSAID together. Now, another group of drugs are anti-helicobacter pylori drugs. So pay attention here. We use multiple drugs for the treatment of or for the eradication of helicobacter pylori. No single agent is effective. So we need to combine the drugs here. Combination therapy for 14 days provides the greatest efficacy here. And sometimes it is also given for seven days, but 14 days is the preferred one. First line treatment is triple therapy. And if triple therapy is ineffective, we go for quadruple therapy. Now, triple therapy is a combination of three drugs together. Quadruple therapy is a combination of four drugs. Now, what are those? Now, see here. Okay, ready? Now, see this. These are the anti helicobacter pylori drugs. This is the triple therapy. Is a quadruple therapy. Now, triple therapy has got different combination here. Okay, bismuth sub silicylate plus metronidazole plus tetracycline is one. Okay, ranitidine plus tetracycline plus crelithromycin or metronidazole, omeprazole 
plus clarithromycin plus metronidazole or amoxicillin. Okay. Now, these are the third one is very, very popular from the clinical point of view. The third one, omeprazole or lansoprazole, one of the PPI, you can remember like that, one PPI with clarithromycin with either metronidazole or amoxicillin, any one of them. And this is the dose. You don't need to remember the dose now. Okay. Uh, it will be known later on. Don't put a lot of pressure to yourself. Now, quadruple therapy is a combination of four drugs. One PPI, bismuth, metronidazole, and tetracycline. And both of these are given for two weeks duration. Now, after uh, going through those medical management, let's talk about the surgical management of peptic ulcer disease. Now you are, you are uh, learning surgery here. So this surgical management are very commonly asked in your exam rather than the medical one. Medical teacher may love to ask those medical questions, but surgical teacher mainly focuses on the surgical management, okay? So please pay attention. What are the indications of elective surgery? in case of peptic ulcer disease. First indication is when the medical management fails, you have tried for that, but that is not helping the patient. You could to go for surgery. Prevention of recurrent complication when the patient is at high risk, definitely. Patient is at high risk means there is a, you know, for example, some tumor, okay? A tumor which is producing gastrin. And that gastrin is constantly present there, which is increasing the production of hydrochloric acid. So there is high chance of recurrent type of ulceration. Possibly as a protection in patient who cannot be without non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Now, can you tell me some of the medical condition where we need to treat our patient with uh, NSAID for a longer time? Yes, what are those conditions? Anybody? Rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis and gout. Very good. Yes, gout, rheumatoid arthritis, and osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is even more important than rheumatoid arthritis because it is more common in the general population. And these are quite painful conditions in our body, you know. Uh, chronic back pain is another one. So patients need to take these medicines to have a good quality of life. But at the same time, these medicines uh, can do extensive damage. And one of that is formation of peptic ulcer. So what should we do? Okay, if peptic ulcer is already there in the patient, on top of that, they need to take medicine. Now, they cannot you know, take this medicine in the presence of peptic ulcer. So let's treat the peptic ulcer with the help of surgery. So that is one of the indication. For financial reason, okay, in some of the patient, financial reason, now look at the meaning here. In some country, the patient has to pay for drugs, but the operation is free. Or sometimes the surgery is considerably cheaper than the long-term drug therapy. Okay, so it depends on the patient's choice. And one of the points I need to add here is patient's choice also. We have to explain the situation to the patient party and they should give consent to us. Yes, doctor, I am ready to go for surgery. Go ahead. Always consent is necessary. And second is emergency surgery. For ulcer related complication, we need to go for emergency surgery. There is no time to wait. We cannot plan that surgery. It's an emergency procedure. For example, perforation of the peptic ulcer. You cannot wait. Bleeding peptic ulcer. You cannot wait. Okay, so these are some of the important points. Let's move on. Now, what are the different types of surgery here? Different operations that may perform include vagotomy and partial gastrectomy. So vagotomy and partial gastrectomy. So vagotomy is the division of the vagus nerve. Now tell me, what is the function of the vagus nerve regarding acid secretion? What vagus nerve is doing there? Uh, 
posterior or inferior vagal trunk inhibit the ash secretion so all of you are absolutely correct and all of you are saying the same thing here very good there are anterior and posterior vagal trunk okay and both of them okay are uh, inducing or increasing the acid secretion there okay this is parasympathetic supply to the stomach and it is always increasing the acid secretion through acetylcholine release so if we divide this vagus nerve then we believe the production of hydrochloric acid would be less and this is one of the important therapy mainly in case of duodenal ulceration remember duodenal ulcer is associated with increased acid secretion and regarding the gastric ulcer we mainly go for partial type of gastrectomy now operative procedure depends upon types of peptic ulcer location and recurrence so let's talk about this in a detail now see here so vagotomy is the removal of all or some of the branches of the vagus nerve so there are different terms we use according to the type of division or procedure we do okay so these different terms are truncal vagotomy selective vagotomy or highly selective vagotomy you see this truncal vagotomy means the trunk of the vagus nerves are divided like anterior vagal trunk and posterior vagal trunk they are divided and it is associated with a lot of complications or problem because our gi tract needs that vagus nerve innervation selective vagotomy means okay probably those uh, branches of the vagus nerve which are supplying that ulcer area are divided and highly selective means the branches of the vagus nerve which are supplying the parietal cells are divided if this type of surgery can be done then this is the best one the highly selective if not selective is fine but truncal vagotomy has a lot of problem though it can be done i am not saying you know it cannot be done but if it is done then we need to go for some reconstructive procedure because pylorus is no more supplied if we cut these thing you know so some pyloroplasty has to be done there otherwise the food cannot uh, move distally and this form of treatment is used mainly for chronic duodenal ulceration i have already told about now let's talk about this vagotomy so very interesting so please uh, pay attention truncal vagotomy is done always with some drainage procedure this is known as some plastic procedure a truncal vagotomy involves division of the anterior and posterior vagal trunk close to the abdominal esophagus and remember anterior vagal trunk is developed from the left you know vagus nerve posterior vagal trunk is developed from the right one so truncal vagotomy denervate the antero pyloric mechanism and therefore some sort of procedure is necessary to bypass the pylorus and that is pyloroplasty or gastrojejunostomy pyloroplasty is uh, you know more commonly done here uh, means you know probably the pyloric sphincter is divided and then uh, reanastomosis is done again or another type of uh, you know uh, this reconstruction mechanism is gastrojejunostomy the left over stomach is connected with the loop of jejunum we bypass the duodenum here okay this is another way now look at this picture these are very very important one okay all of you please focus on your slide now look here this is esophagus okay this is the lower end of the esophagus so these are the vagal trunk we have okay anterior and posterior vagal trunk now truncal vagotomy means you you cut the vagus nerve right there okay so all all of the you know distal branches of the vagus nerve would be gone now right so there are severe problem regarding the peristaltic movement that's what we are talking right now so you need to do some you know pyloroplasty or reconstructive mechanism here like 
stomach is directly you know uh, anastomos with the jejunum see this this is gastro jejunostomy so food can directly go from the stomach to the jejunum now another one is pyloroplasty okay the the pyloric sphincter is divided like this say this like this and then you know uh, the muscle is divided and then it is sutured remember the surgery which we do in case of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis what is the name of that surgery you still remember yesterday we talked about procedure yes what is that ramstead pyloromyotomy yes sir ramstead pyloromyotomy exactly it is known as ramstead operation very good ramstead pyloromyotomy wonderful so there we have just exactly like this division the longitudinal division of the pyloric sphincter and the mucosa is not cut you know mucosa is allowed to prolapse and then the obstruction is relieved here there is no obstruction like that please do not have that in mind there is no obstruction like that but because of the loss of peristaltic movement after the division of this vagal trunk okay we need to do this otherwise there is obstruction of the passage of food so pyloroplasty is done together with truncal vagotomy now on the other hand what is selective type of vagotomy the vagal fiber which are passing to the stomach are divided while those fiber passing to and from the abdominal viscera are preserved so only the stomach fibers are divided here selective type of vagotomy so there is lower incidence of complications such as severe diarrhea compared to truncal vagotomy but the ulcer recurrence rate is higher because you have not completely divided the nerve which are supplying the parietal nerve now the third one is called parietal cell vagotomy or highly selective vagotomy so what is the meaning of that the surgeon will divide only those very small branches of the vagus nerve that are supplying the parietal cells and the surgeon do not touch those branches of the vagus nerve which supply other parts of the gi tract or other parts of the stomach so the antrum okay remains innervated in this surgery that they don't divide the nerves which are supplying the antral area of the stomach so that there is no problem of further you know passage of the food distally towards the duodenum and it is a you know more demanding surgery technically because those are very small nerves they should be found out and then divided so highly experienced surgeon is necessary to do this type of surgery the advantage of highly selective vagotomy is the antral motility remains the same okay so there is less chance of complication like dumping syndrome and diarrhea and a drainage procedure procedure is unnecessary here because you have not cut the nerves which are supplying the antral area or the pyloric area so if they ask you question which type of vagotomy is the best okay uh, uh, for the patient the answer is very simple this is highly selective vagotomy but it is a demanding type of surgery now look at this picture here all of you please pay attention so here you know only those uh, branches of the vagus nerve okay which are going to this area they are divided the branches of the vagus nerve which are going to this area are not divided this is known as highly selective type of vagotomy okay because the parietal cells are mainly present in the body of the you know stomach or in the fundic area okay so that's why the the message of this picture all about now let's move further what is another type of surgery we do for the treatment of peptic ulcer disease that is partial gastrectomy partial gastrectomy means part of the stomach is removed or resected and it should always be followed by you know reconstruction procedure that is anastomosis between the remaining part of the stomach and you know jejunum or duodenum so accordingly there are different types this is known as 
Billroth one partial gastrectomy or Billroth two partial gastrectomy. This Billroth one and Billroth two are terms are given because of the reconstruction which is done after doing partial gastrectomy. Now please pay attention. This is a very favorite question of the examiner. A Billroth one type of partial gastrectomy means it is a standard type of operation for a chronic gastric ulcer, and in this gastrectomy the distal stomach and the pylorus including the ulcer is excised or removed so the proximal part of the stomach is left behind and end to end gastroduodenal anastomosis is made to restore the continuity of the gi tract so very simple you remove the ulcer area okay ulcer area that is on the distal part of the stomach along with pylorus and the upper part of the stomach is left behind just like that so that left behind part is connected with duodenum it is connected with duodenum to restore the continuity now what is the problem of this billroth one type of partial gastrectomy what complication can happen anyone yes reflex from duodenum reflex yes exactly reflux of the bile from the duodenum into the stomach that can happen so easily okay it is happening very easily here that's why this type of you know partial gastrectomy is not commonly done these days because that bile is a toxic substance it can itself lead to ulcer formation later on and it can also lead to development of carcinoma over a long period of time so billroth two types of partial gastrectomy is thought about and it is developed now what is this it is reserved for duodenal ulceration and it involves resecting two thirds of the stomach closing the duodenum distal to the pylorus usually beyond the ulcer definitely and end to end or end to side sorry gastrojejunal anastomosis is done so you do not uh, you know connect the leftover part of the stomach with the duodenum here rather you connect okay the stomach with jejunum and this is end to side anastomosis so duodenum is bypass and duodenum is there like a closed loop or a blind loop not completely blind also because the distal end is still open and it it needs to be opened you know because otherwise bile cannot pass into the jejunum but the proximal end is closed okay but sometimes it can act like a blind loop uh, and that area actually above the second part of the duodenum that area may be colonized by bacteria in this case so this is known as billroth type 2 partial gastrectomy it can be done for gastric ulcer as well now let's see some of the picture and try to make our concept quite clear here see there have a look here okay please pay attention on the slide now this is gastric ulcer here is a gastric ulcer so the surgeon will cut this part of the stomach but the proximal part of the stomach is left behind just like that okay now if the surgeon has to go for the reconstruction procedure means the leftover part has to be joined again to give the continuity for the gi tract and it is done like this see here this is the leftover part of the stomach here the duodenum so it is connected together so this is gastro duodenostomy gastro duodenostomy okay so this is known as billroth one gastrectomy very easy so this is a uh, another you know good one good picture see here this is the proximal part of the stomach which is left behind the distal part of the stomach where the ulcer was there is resected and then the duodenum is connected there so this is billroth 1 gastroduodenal anastomosis now what is billroth 2 then let's see so see here this is billroth 2 gastrectomy 
So what what they have done? Okay, this this can be done for gastric ulcer. I've already told you. See here. Here is the ulcer. So this part of the stomach is sacrificed or excised, but uh, the proximal part of the stomach is left behind. Now we have to go for the reconstruction procedure. So what we have done, it is not connected with the duodenum anymore. It is connected with the loop of the jejunum. This is jejunum. So duodenum is here somewhere here, you know, the, the, the proximal end of the duodenum is somewhere here. So this is known as Bilroth two type of procedure. So can you tell me what is the advantage of Bilroth two procedure over Bilroth one? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, so there will be no reflex of the bile. So there will be no biliary reflex back to the uh, stomach, sir. Exactly. That is the main, you know, advantage here. And this Bilroth two concept is developed only because of that. Now, how can the bile be, you know, uh, reflux up, isn't it? It is difficult. The bile is flowing here, first here, okay, it is coming here, then probably it is going there, and it is still has got some chance of reflux, but the chance is much lesser than the Bilroth one. Still has got chance, you know, because of this stump, which is connected, but the chance is much lesser than a Bilroth one. This is Bilroth two, gastrectomy another picture which is uh, provided here all of you please have a look this is even better than the previous one this is the common bile duct common bile duct is opening in the second part of the duodenum look at this the first part of the duodenal stump is closed okay uh, and then bile will flow from here see this this is a collection of the bile actually now this is jejunum so the jejunum is connected with the leftover part of the stomach. This is end to side on anastomosis. And uh, you know the continuity of the GI tract is maintained. The food from the stomach will directly pass to the jejunum now. And bile is flowing from here. And this bile will be mixing uh, in this area now. Okay. So this is Bilroth to gastrectomy with reconstruction procedure. Now, what are the complications of a surgery which are done for peptic ulcer? Complications of surgery. The complications uh, due to partial gastrectomy and complications due to vagotomy can occur. Now let's talk about them one after other. These are the complications due to partial gastrectomy. See here, first is rapid feeling of fullness because the size of the stomach is very small now, because you have removed more than half of the stomach already, okay? So it, it gives rise to feeling of fullness, even after eating a slight amount of food. But patient will be habitual after some time. That's why it tends to improve over the first few months. Second is a bilious vomiting, because of the reflux of the bile, quite easy to understand. What is called dumping syndrome. Now, dumping syndrome means because of the size of the stomach is very small, whatever content we eat, okay, it will quickly go distally. It will quickly go to the distal part of the intestine. And it can give rise to a lot of problems there. If especially if we eat a bit of osmotically rich type of food, like high protein load of food, high carbohydrate, you know they can draw a lot of fluid into the lumen of the bowel and they can lead to some changes in our body, like some autonomic disturbance would be there, okay? Some flushing, palpitation, and those things are there. We'll talk about that a bit later on, but this is the meaning of dumping syndrome. Another is a bolus obstruction of the gastric outlet stoma. If we eat a bit of, you know, uh, for example, uh, not a liquid type of diet, a solid type of food. And that solid type of food may cause obstruction of that re-anastomose area that is known as gastric outlet stoma. Blind loop syndrome is the another one. This is a complication of Bilroth 2 gastrectomy due to bacterial overgrowth in the blind ended loop. 
and it is a, it is not seen in bilrat 1 because in bilrat 1 it is directly connected to the duodenum there is no blind loop there but in bilrat 2 we have connected the leftover stomach onto the jejunal loop so duodenum has got one blind loop there especially above the second part of the duodenum you know so there may be the overgrowth of the bacteria and it can lead to diarrhea later on it is one of the cause of malabsorption as well now features related to malabsorption may be there there are lots of function of our stomach and stomach a size is sacrificed now right so probably the patient may suffer from anemia anemia and that anemia may be iron deficiency anemia or vitamin b12 deficiency anemia now tell me why iron deficiency anemia is occurring here why because of poor absorption mm -hmm. so, okay any other student good i'll come to you because iron absorb in the stomach mm -hmm. any other answer a part of the stomach is removed which absorb iron mm -hmm. now so iron is absorbed in duodenum here we uh, close the duodenum and here we are contacting with jejunum mm -hmm. now some of the points which we have mentioned are correct okay but a little bit more explanation is necessary here now what is the function of stomach yesterday i told you okay no no student or no one is uh, repeating that here remember the hydrochloric acid which is present on our stomach okay is converting the ferric form of the iron to the ferrous form. The ferric form of the iron is converted into the ferrous form and then that ferrous form of the iron is absorbed not from the stomach. Iron is mainly absorbed from the intestine, duodenum and jejunum. Okay, But stomach has very important role to play there. It is mixing the food, it is churning the food, it is making that bigger macronutrient into the smaller one and uh, you know, it is helping in that way converting the ferric into the ferrous form. So even in case of gastrectomy, because of this mechanism, which are gone now, iron deficiency anemia may result. And vitamin B12 deficiency is because of what mechanism? Yes? Intrinsic, intrinsic factor in uh, parietal cells. Yes, sir. Exactly. Exactly. Because of lack of intrinsic factor, you can simply say that because of lack of the intrinsic factor, okay? Because you have sacrificed the stomach here. And these features are much more common in case of total gastrectomy than partial gastrectomy. But nevertheless, in partial gastrectomy also, they can happen. Osteomalacia due to calcium and vitamin D malabsorption. Now, this, you know, partial gastrectomy is associated with malabsorption as well. You can also give this type of reason because of, you know, blind loop syndrome, these microorganisms may, may migrate downwards and they can lead to, you know, malabsorption. That also is a very strong reason here. And another reason is because of that anastomosis. Remember, uh, the food can quickly pass distally, quickly. Okay? There is no real, you know, uh, storage uh, function of the stomach left behind because we have removed the stomach, large part of the stomach is removed. So food cannot stay there longer. Food can quickly go distally. And there is no real time for the, you know, a digestion and absorption to occur. And this is another reason for malabsorption. Weight loss and steatorrhea can happen. What is steatorrhea? Sir, fat and fatty stool. Fat is stool. Fat is stool. Exactly. Fat excretion in the stool or appearance of fatty stool is known as steatorrhea. It's a one of the features of malabsorption. Another complication may be ulceration. Now, the recurrent ulceration of the gastric remnant or stomal origin can happen in about one portion of the cases. And this recurrent ulceration can occur because of reflux of the bile or because of the production of the acid as well. And one of the very, very important complication is 
there is increased risk of subsequent gastric malignancy or carcinoma of the stomach in the left over part of the stomach. In the, in the next topic, when we talk about, uh, not in today's class, definitely, in the next class, when I teach you about the carcinoma of the stomach, one of the risk factor of carcinoma of the stomach is partial gastrectomy. Now, what are the complications of vagotomy then? Due to vagotomy, what complication happened to the patient? Let's talk about it. The major problems of vagotomy are diarrhea, okay, diarrhea, dumping syndrome, and gallstones. Diarrhea, dumping syndrome, and gallstone. Now we need to think about this mechanism here. Okay, they are a little bit tricky. Now, why diarrhea occurs after vagotomy? Okay. Anybody? Let, let, let me give a bit of you know, chance to the students to speak here and, and I'll explain. Now, why diarrhea after vagotomy? Anyone? So maybe a, a affect the peristalsis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody? Any other student? The rear vagus nerve is uh, cutting, so peristalsis has effect. But if peristalsis is absent, then it will lead to it should lead to constipation, isn't it? Yes or no? If you decrease the peristalsis by cutting the vagus nerve, then rather than diarrhea, uh, it should lead to constipation. Yes, yes. Go on. Uh, like I said, because like I said, you did this loss of like vagus never said that loss of like sir, sort of peristaltic sir like sir after vagotomy like sir basically uh, like sir like a lot of fluid and electrolytes and like sir the mild and the mild absorbed nutrient so they directly enter the colon sir and I believe that this can lead to the uh, diarrhea sir okay now now uh, you know the points are coming here so please listen this is a very important question which is asked to the student see that you are right yes. After you cut the vagus nerve, there is problem in the peristalsis. But remember, if there is no peristalsis, then there is no movement of the uh, GI tract, isn't it? And if there is no movement, then there should be constipation. That should be the natural thinking. You are thinking in a very good way, but there is some other thing happening there. And that is, along with vagotomy, we need to do some reconstruction procedure like pyloroplasty. And because of this pyloroplasty, remember the foods are quickly moving distally. They're quickly moving. There's no real control left now. And the highly osmotic food, if it moves distally, then it can draw a lot of fluid from the mucosa of the intestine. Okay, there is no real time for the absorption and digestion to occur and it can result in diarrhea. Okay, that is the mechanism here, okay? Classically, the patient episodically passes one or two loose stool with an intervening diarrhea free period of three to four weeks. Now, dumping syndrome, I'll talk a bit later uh, you know, in a different slide, but uh, the point you already know. And gallstone, now can you tell me why gallstone is more common now after vagotomy? Yes? Why? Uh, there is no fatty stimulation in the duodenum, sir. There is no cholecystokinin, and there is no uh, 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 contraction of the gallstone, sir. Gall, uh, sir, there for uh, while stay longer time in the gall, uh, gallbladder, it leads with the gallstone. Excellent, excellent. That is the mechanism. Very good. That's why you know uh, I've already told you if a truncal type of vagotomy is done then the innervation which is given to the gallbladder and the nearby areas are gone. And without a you know, vagus nerve supply, the gallbladder cannot contract. The gallbladder will continue to you know, accept the bile, but the bile is not flowing from there. Means there is stasis of the bile and stasis of the bile can lead to bile or gallstone formation. So this is the mechanism. So let me write, here for you, this is because of stasis of the bile, so that you can go through this and remember later on, stasis of bile. 
because of loss of innervation, gallstones can occur. Now, this dumping syndrome can be asked, uh, you know, as a separate question sometimes. So let me go through it. Dumping is the description of abdominal distension, colic or abdominal pain, and some vasomotor disturbances which may occur after meals following gastrectomy or a drainage procedure like vagotomy. In both situations, dumping syndrome can occur. So abdominal distension, colic or abdominal pain, and some of the autonomic disturbances, which are known as vasomotor disturbance. Two types are recognized, early dumping and late dumping. Now let's go through them. What is the meaning? Now early dumping syndrome means when gastric contents of high osmolarity passing rapidly into the small intestine, we call that early dumping. This leads to an outpowering of the fluid into the small intestine because of this osmolar osmolarity. Remember, they will attract, they will draw the fluid there, okay, to dilute the bowel content, thereby reducing the blood volume and produces cardiovascular and GI symptoms. Because of the hypovolemia, cardiovascular symptoms will be there. And because of excessive collection of the fluid inside the intestine, you know, GI symptoms will be there like faintness, sweating, tachycardia, okay? These are the features of cardiovascular problem because of hypovolemia, because of a sympathetic stimulation and bloating, nausea and cramping type of abdominal pain is because of collection of the fluid inside the intestine. Quite easy to understand. The principal treatment here is dietary manipulation or dietary modification. So what type of diet should we, you know, advise them? Okay, a small, dry type of meals are the best and avoiding fluid with a high carbohydrate content also help because this carbohydrate, you know, uh, they can draw the fluid inside the lumen of the bowel and they can produce dumping syndrome. So, a frequent small type of meals and relatively dry type of meals are best. But of course, fluid should be given to the patient, you know, and that fluid uh, should not contain a lot of carbohydrate. Now, what is late dumping then? This is due to hypoglycemia occurring about two hours after a meal because of large initial secretion of insulin in response to the high sugar load present in the food. If patient has eaten more carbohydrate containing food, you know, then uh, it can happen because there is no real, uh, you know, storage of the food by the stomach that that food is quickly going distally to the intestine. Okay, so it, it is, uh, you know, inducing the release of insulin and then insulin will lead to hypoglycemia and then all sort of problem. The syndrome is less common than early dumping and symptoms include that of hypoglycemia, like faintness, sweating, tremor, nausea, and feeling of emptiness and nervousness, okay? A bit of, you know, like the person feels a sense of hunger as well. The person feels a bit of nervous and a little bit of, you know, uh, scared type of, you know, feeling that is very common in case of hypoglycemia. The dietary changes should be the same. Don't allow to eat a carbohydrate rich fluid or the food. However, the patient can also take sweets, which can be taken as soon as the symptoms start to prevent a severe hypoglycemia because it is associated with insulin release. Remember that insulin is causing hypoglycemia. So some of the sweets may be allowed here just to make sure that patient is free of hypoglycemia. And after that, uh, the carbohydrate uh, intake in a good amount should be cut off. So this is about, uh, you know, the concept of dumping syndrome and the management as well. So these are all the different types of management 
of peptical strategy. Now, let me summarize, you know, you may be a bit of confused because we have talked a lot about the management. Let me highlight some of the important points. So please pay attention here. One is the general management of peptic ulcer. We advise the patient to change some of the lifestyle. If the patient is a smoker, they should quit smoking. If the patient is a drinker, they should quit drinking. If patient is taking a lot of stress in the life, they should decrease that stress. Okay, so these are the important points. Second, medical management. We always start with the medical management first because it's easy to do. Different types of drugs are there. Antacid, S2 receptor blocker, proton pump inhibitor, sucralfet, bismuth, misoprostol, even anticholinergic drugs are given sometimes, okay? Because acetylcholine is involved there. Pyrenjepin, telenjepin are the drugs which are anticholinergic here. Now, the third modality is surgery. So there are different indications for surgery. Sometimes medical management fails. Sometimes patient chooses for surgery, you know. So sometimes complications are arising and we have to go for surgery quickly. So these are the different indications there. And the different types of surgery, which we do in case of peptic ulcer disease treatment are gastrectomy and vagotomy. Gastrectomy or partial gastrectomy, never the total one. This is not a case of cancer, not the total. It is always partial. And vagotomy. Vagotomy are of different type truncal, selective, and highly selective. And partial gastrectomy should be done uh, 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 along with some reconstruction procedure like Bilrath 1 or Bilrath 2, okay? And uh, pegotomy, if it is a truncal one, then it should also be followed by, you know, pyloroplasty. There should be some reconstruction procedure done in the pyloric area. And these are the difficult type of treatments. So a lot of complication can happen to the patient, but we have to manage those complications because for the treatment, this type of surgery are necessary. Okay, so at the end, I like to request you all to like the video as much as possible, share it among your friends and subscribe to the channel so that it will encourage me a lot for the future videos and recordings. Thank you so much.